Well, today we will start looking at what I think can properly be thought of as the first Christian sermon in church history, making today a sermon on a sermon. And we're actually going to spend a few weeks on the sermon, so I get to do several sermons on a sermon. It's more than that. It's more than just first. It's really an era-defining sermon. This sermon that, that Peter is about to preach is part of this inaugurating event of the birthday of the church. We call it Pentecost. It, it ushers in a new era of God's plan of redemption. An age, we, we often call it the church age. One that we are still in to this day. And so it compels us to think about the past. That is, what got us up to this point. While we were also still looking forward to some things. And so in light of what God has done in the past to bring us here and what he's going to do for us in the future, what he's promising to do, how then should we live now? Neither ignoring the past nor ignoring the future are really valuable modes of thought. Because in order to understand who we really are, we need to know where we've, where we've come from and where we're going. But at the same time, we don't want to live in the past or be obsessed with the future because we are where we are. You might say we are when we are. Jesus himself had just said in Acts chapter 1, describing this day that is now upon the church, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And today, in Acts 2, is that day. This birthday of the church. And so it should come to no surprise to any of us that on this day, and as we continue to look through the second chapter of Acts, that we will continue to observe that this chapter, this message, is absolutely soaked with the power of God's Holy Spirit. When we think about power, we sometimes think of that in creative terms. We think about the power to create, the ability to make something. And indeed, that is true of God. Maybe when we think about power, we think about it in terms of authority, the status of being in charge. And indeed, that is true of God. We also may think about power in terms of strength, endurance, the ability to withstand or even thwart the machinations of an enemy, a rival. And indeed, God has no companion in his power class. That is all good news, is it not? Amen. It puts into my mind the song that many of us learned as children. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Truly, God is so big, so strong, so mighty, that God, but he's more than just so big, so strong, so mighty, to really understand the nature of God's power that is now poured out in the Holy Spirit, we have to understand that God is powerful to do things that no one or no thing else can do. He has the power to save the sinner. Rescue the lost. Give sight to the blind. And when we think about the power of God, that is the category that we need to be thinking in. The kind of thing that only God has the power to do. Our passage today is going to continue to demonstrate that power by explaining to those who observed it 2,000 years ago and to us all these years later that God can and will do what he has promised. And what ultimately is that? To make right what is wrong. To heal what is broken. To punish evil and to uphold what is good. He is mighty to save. And here he pours out his spirit. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today that we stand here in the tradition of two millennia that began on a day when in your mercy you chose to pour out your spirit on your people. 
And though we cannot observe that day with our own eyes, I pray that you would make very real to us a sense of the power of your Holy Spirit. Because what, come, what came on that day comes for us, the promise of your Holy Spirit to not just occasionally visit, but to reside, to take up residence in the life of the believer. And so, Father, I pray that by his power that you would guide our hearts and minds to what is true and that you would drive us to our knees, that you would have your way in all of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll work through the passage today in three sections. Three Ps, because I can't resist. First, we'll take a look at the players involved, the who's who, who's, who's involved here. We read about this in the first two verses of our passage. But Peter, standing with the eleven, this is verse 14, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. So the first player we want to make note of and spend some time thinking about here is the Apostle Peter. It's probably easy to pass over the phrase, lifted up his voice, but even that is is pretty amazing if you take the time to think about it. Because when Peter lifts up his voice here in verse 14, this is the beginning of the mission that Jesus laid out in chapter 1. When he said, you will be my witnesses, first what? In Jerusalem. So this is the the very first moment of that happening. You will be my witnesses. And now Peter, in Jerusalem, lifted up his voice. He's now doing it. The mission has begun with this simple sermon. Now there's so much that we could say about the wonders of God's redemptive work and his mercy by simply observing the fact that Peter is the one that God has chosen to speak on this momentous occasion. Uh, Peter, right? you know a little bit about his story. The rough around the edges, coarse speaking fisherman. The, the once wisdom spouting follower of Jesus who could say, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And but moments later have to be rebuked by Jesus himself because he didn't understand what Christ was here to do. This is Peter, the ear cutting oath breaker. Who in one night employs a sword in, in a stupid attempt to defend his Messiah while swearing to the face of Jesus that he would never deny him, and moments later deny him three times, accompanied with swears. I swear I'll never deny you. I swear I never knew him. One night. This is the man who then, upon receiving the news that the tomb was empty, he ran to the empty tomb. To see it for himself. Days later, we find Peter doing what he's always done. He's trying to catch some fish. Thinking about some of the things that have transpired, no doubt. Knowing, according to the book of John, that Jesus had just shown mercy to Thomas, the one who had doubted him. Perhaps wondering if there could be mercy enough for himself, the one who had denied him. And now here he is on another failing expedition. I'd have to imagine that he's got a lot on his mind. And then from a distance, he sees his Lord on the shore. And Peter promptly throws himself in the sea. So wracked with guilt, so desperate to be forgiven, he could not get to Jesus fast enough. But oh, what a perfect vessel Peter turned out to be. It wasn't his gift with words. It wasn't his intellect, his upbringing. It wasn't an impressive resume of any kind that qualified him for this moment. By his mercy, 
God qualified him. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, there was no weakness of Peter that could not be overcome. In addition with Peter, he is not alone. He's with the the apostles. I believe we have every reason to believe he's with all 120. We gather this from just the flow of thought here. We know that there's Peter, there's the other 11 apostles, there are the four half-brothers of Jesus, there's Mary, his mother, as well as the rest of this group of 120 followers of Jesus who are present, who have experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, who have accompanied with the mighty rushing wind and the divided tongues, and they're now they're speaking in tongues, and this miraculous event has happened. There are 120 of them. And of course, we read this last week, the observers are like, what in the world is going on? They are struggling to understand it. And some of the people who are probably of a more skeptical mind, they come up with a theory. Maybe they must be drunk. And so this was the observer's theory to explain this activity. And then in his message, Peter addresses this objection right off the bat, saying, um, yeah, it's pretty early. In fact, if you do the the translation, it's 9 a.m. All right. It's nine in the morning. We're not drunk. Okay. There's a better explanation. But the behavior of the 120 does need an explanation. It's like nothing the world has ever seen. So he'll begin to offer that in a moment. But before we do that, let's, let's take a moment and let's, let's consider the importance of the observers. This is the other category of the player. So we've got Peter, we have the 120, and now we have the observers. So we know that on this occasion, there are Jewish people from all over the world who have gathered because three times a year, there are feasts which require Jewish males to come to Jerusalem to partake in the festivities. And this was one of them. There was uh, the Feast of First Fruits or the Feast of, what's the other name? There's two names, I can't remember. And they were in the Feast of Weeks, there it is. They were in town for this feast. And so there are literally Jews from all over the world here in Jerusalem. Uh, We call this the diaspora, the scattering of all of God's people. And we know that this has been going on for around 700 plus years. When Assyria came and conquered them and they scattered them, they went all over the place. And then Babylon came and conquered Judah and they took them into captivity. And then some of them were brought back in. Some of you know how that kind of story goes. But at this point, there are Jews all around the Mediterranean, up on the Italian, Greek, side, down through Turkey, down through uh, Iran, Iraq, the Arabian, in Egypt, Libya, I mean, all around, okay? They're all over the place, and they've all gathered here in Jerusalem. I think that matters. I believe that there is some really important messaging going on in this passage that we can connect in a meaningful way, Acts 2, with Genesis 11. Genesis 11 is a passage that that gives us the account of the Tower of Babel. Now, maybe you know how this goes. This is just after the flood, and the people were told to go. God wanted his image bearers to spread out. But the people were not interested in that because they wanted to make a name for themselves, not for God. And they realized that they had a best chance of doing this by staying together in direct defiance of the will of God. So they come together, they build a, a, a building to reach God, right? The Tower of Babel. They want to uphold themselves rather than obey what God has taught them. God's not too pleased with this. So what did he do? He confused their tongues. Glossolalia, right? And forced them to go. You don't want to go on my terms? Okay, you'll, I'll make you go. I'll make it so that you can't live with each other anymore and you'll have to spread out just to get along. So he confuses their language and scatters them. Okay? Now, we have something kind of similar happen. We have glossolalia, but the nations have been brought back to Jerusalem into one place. And they're all going home soon. They're all going to be able to testify to what they have seen in this most holy a place. In fact, we know that as the the apostles and and Paul would go out and start preaching the gospel, they would find that 
people were already believing. These people did, in fact, convert and go out and start spreading the word all over the Mediterranean. I think this matters because um, some of you have read Michael Heiser's book, I believe, and this would be a helpful resource for you on this. He talks about something called the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. You can read that on your own time. But there's a couple of key verses in there that explain the meaning of Genesis 11, what happened there, why it happened, its fallout. And it basically boils down to that God scattered them as a consequence for what happened, right? They're sent out, they're confused. But this was not the plan. God does intend to have people from all tribe, tongue, nation, and all that, right, who would be united for him, to be a people who are of one mind. And this is a temporary disruption of that plan. And it, Michael Heiser puts it this way. If you were to ask a Jew at this time, you know, uh, the, new, the Second Temple era, what's wrong with the world? You know, if I were to ask you, what's wrong with the world? As a Christian, most of us would say something like sin. And that is correct. But it's not the only answer to that question. And so we, we would refer people to the Genesis 3 problem. Sin came into the world, and we live in a fallen world, and that what's, explains what's wrong with the world. But they would go even further, and they would we'd talk about the Genesis 6 problem and the Genesis 11 problem. The world is the way it is, and we know this from Deuteronomy 32, because as a consequence, because God's people rebelled, because they did not do what he asked them to do, he, he scattered them, he confused their tongues as part of that, and he set over them lesser gods to, to run the show, to be in charge. You don't want me? Okay, you can have this dude. And he's not going to treat you the way I would. You can read all about that all in your own time. But part of God's redemptive plan in the world, this is, we're trying to bring it back together, is not just about fixing the Genesis 3 problem. It's about fixing the Genesis 11 problem. God desires for there to be a people who exist for his glory and his renown and are spread out throughout the entire world where there is one God that is exalted, not many. And I believe that this messaging by God bringing these people from the nations to Jerusalem where this event happens, where they're speaking in multiple tongues, sort of mirroring that event in a way, then they go to spread out the one singular message about the Christ and what he's done. God is beginning to reverse the curse, not just of Genesis 3, but of Genesis 11. So this birthday of the church signifies a new era in redemptive history. The curse of sin is being reversed because of what Jesus did on the cross. And the curse of Genesis 11, the disinheriting of the nations, is being reversed as well. And God intends to bring many sons to glory. Now let's look at this prophecy in verse 16. Here Peter is going to use as part of his sermon the Old Testament. I mean, those were his scriptures. So if he's going to preach the scriptures, he's got to preach from the Old Testament. And he uses the Old Testament here to, to explain the objection. They must be drunk. No, we're not drunk. Here's the explanation. Here's what's really happening. And he doesn't make something up. He quotes scripture. Verse 16. We'll read through 20. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh... And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. Now, not all prophecy is predictive. Prophecy just means to speak in the place of God, what he has instructed. But this one clearly is. This one clearly uh, contains some predictions about the future. The question then for us, is Peter, by citing this passage in Joel 2, 
trying to tell us that this prophecy is now fulfilled in its entirety or that it's beginning to be fulfilled. And this is a process that begins on this day. Is it completely fulfilled or starting to be fulfilled? Well, answering that question takes us right back to a really important concept. We talked about it a few weeks ago and we have to talk about it on occasion especially if we're going to talk about anything that's related to prophecy, Old and New Testament alike. And this is the already but not yet tension. And it's very important that we have this in the front of our minds when we think about how to understand properly biblical prophecy. There are errors in both sides. So if we want to take the view and just think it's all fulfilled, there's the other view of just, no, it's all not yet, right? So we can... We can get the balance wrong, and there are problems with both. So let's talk about the already. Those who want to put everything in the already camp have a tendency to spiritualize things that shouldn't be spiritualized. For instance, I I won't chapter and verse you here, but just there are things that that describe the the, the land, the domain that his nation should have, a physical, geographical uh, space. There are very specific demands or prophecies for the dimensions of the temple that has not yet been built. There are all kinds of things like this in the Old Testament which talk about future events that come with the second coming of the Lord. But someone who wants to say these things are fulfilled already, like in the church, has to spiritualize all of that and say, yeah, I know what Ezekiel wrote about the temple, but actually the temple is just the body of Christ to say nothing of the specific dimensions. I know that the, that the Old Testament prophets talked about the actual geographical boundaries of Israel, but actually that just means wherever the church is, those are the boundaries. That's the domain. So they have to spiritualize all these things. And sometimes they'll go so far as even to reject the second coming itself. We are in the millennium now, and he's not coming. He's here. This is it. And this is uh, actually a pretty common view. We won't linger on it, but it has all kinds of problems, not the least of which is how hopeless is that? That this is the millennium. We hope it gets better, but that's it. There's no hope, no expectation of a bodily return of Jesus Christ. It's all completely spiritualized. So that's the problem if we, if we just put everything in the already camp. The not yet camp, if we put every, too much in that camp, there are also problems. Now, those of you, like me, you have particular views about how some of that stuff works. We went through Revelation a couple years ago, and we're probably close to each other in agreement on a lot of those things. So we're, this is probably the more likely uh, problem that we are to pursue, putting too much in the not yet camp. Because we go, the second coming is future, the tribulation is future, uh, the temple is future, and the list goes on and on and on and on. The land, the, all, the, all these things. And if we put so much emphasis on the not yet, we sometimes neglect the fact that there are very important aspects of biblical prophecy that are true, that have started to be or are fulfilled. Because you know what? This is what that looks like if we put everything in the not yet camp. We, we like to quote the end of Revelation. Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. And and we get into our little holy huddle and we just wait for the rapture. That's not why we're here. Amen. Okay? That's why it's important that we recognize that there is a tension in biblical prophecy. It's very important that we maintain clarity that there are certain things that are still to come. And that's good news. That gives us something to look forward to. But there are also things that are true already. We have a mission The church is here. The kingdom is here in a spiritual sense. There is a full and final and physical sense. Alliteration, full, final, physical. I can't help, sorry. That's coming, but there is a sense in which it's spiritual now. And that's true. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. And where the church spreads, in a sense, the kingdom goes with it. That's true. And this already but not yet tension is very much present in Joel 2, the passage that Peter cites. So we need to talk about it a little bit. 
This is going to help us sort out some of our doctrines about the church and about the end times and all those kinds of things. So first, there's an important phrase, the last days. That's the way the prophecy begins. Sometimes we read things like uh, the day of the Lord. Uh, That's another common term that we'll find in both the Old and New Testament describing these prophetic events. If you go back and you read Joel 2, you'll notice a few slight little differences. And one of them is instead of saying in the last days, he actually says after those days. Uh, Meaning that that passage is actually situated sequentially in in a line of events. There's something that came before it and there's something that came after it. So that alone would sort of hone our minds into the idea that these things play out over time, not necessarily all at once. The term itself in the New Testament, last days or day of the Lord, can be understood through this already but not yet tension in, in all, all those ways. Let me show you. The last days, you know what? I got news for you. If you didn't know this, they're here. We're in them. And now, I, you, you, you were, yeah, yeah. It's because you're scared, right? right? No, they were here when the New Testament was written. It's not new because of something that happened in Israel. It's not new because Russia might invade Ukraine this week, right? That's not the the sign. No, let me show you. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So the very first two verses of the brief exhortation that is Hebrews lets us know the last days are here. They're here already, you might say. But there's also a sense in which we can say they're still coming. They're out in the future and here at the same time. This is weird, right? 1 John 2, 18. Children, it is, present tense, the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, that's future. So now, present, many Antichrists have come, past. Therefore, we know that it is present, the last hour. You see how it, they're here already and they're coming at the same time. And there's a, there's a lot in that package of not yet here. It's basically, in my view, Revelation 6 to 19. I don't really see much of, if, of that as being fulfilled already. I put pretty much all of that in the not yet camp. So there's a big chunk of scripture that has to do with aspects of the last days that are not yet here. But we do want to be careful and recognize that does not mean It's only this far off thing. There are important truths about the nature of the church, our mission and all that, that is true already. And this is, of course, going to inform our understanding of what Peter's saying about Joel 2, the already aspect. In what sense can he quote Joel 2 to explain what happened here in Acts 2? Because something that was predicted there has happened. It's here already, okay? Well, here, here's what it is. I think it's captured in a very important monumental phrase from Joel. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. If you read carefully in the Old Testament, something that we might think of as the filling of the Holy Spirit only happens on a few rare Occasions. By no means was it common. But here in Joel, God saying through the prophet that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. There's a sense in which it's going to be universal, broad, and common. That day didn't exist in the Old Testament. I think by quoting it, Peter is saying, today is that day. Another ministry of the Holy Spirit, the the technical word is indwelling of the Holy Spirit, does not appear to be an aspect of the Holy Spirit's ministry at all in the Old Testament. Uh, You know, if if you read in the Old Testament, you'll see those few occasions of filling. This is where the Holy Spirit sort of descends 
on a person for a specific moment or purpose. Like the builders, the designers of the, of the tabernacle and things like that, the craftsmen. And there are other few examples. But it wasn't a permanent thing. It wasn't an indwelling as we talk about in New Testament terms. That's new. That's, in my view, part of what it means for this prophecy to be fulfilled. The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Under the terms of the now new covenant, the one that we are still under today as believers, this filling of the Holy Spirit is a common experience, while the indwelling is universally true of all believers. It is fundamental. It is essential. There's no true, genuine believer in whom the Holy Spirit does not reside. It is one of the fundamental promises of the gospel. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's the Holy Spirit. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He just described an exchanged life. I died, he lives in me, through me, as me. That's what it means for him to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It is a term of the new covenant. Read these passages in your own time. Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. Both of these passages describe through the prophets the nature of this new covenant. It's so much better than the old one. Instead of the law it being a matter of law and, and duty, no, I will be their people and they will be my, I will be their God and they will be my people. There's a relationship. No longer will my laws be written on tablets of stone, but tablets of flesh, heart. And we see these things come to reality in Jesus and in the sending of the Holy Spirit. It's also worth noting here in the prophecy of Joel, it includes the pouring out of the Spirit on daughters and female servants who are included in the prophetic work involved here. And now... All these years later, at Pentecost, the company, the 120 who are here, we've already noted from chapter 1, includes not just the 12 disciples, but Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the other women. We know that this is a group of both men and women. And indeed, in that sense, a literal fulfillment of Joel 2 has taken place. The Spirit has come and been poured out on these 120, but in... As this doctrine gets fleshed out by the New Testament writers, we understand this to be a truly defining aspect of a believer who is drawn near to God by means of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in the believer. But there's also a not yet aspect to Joel 2. And so I don't believe that Peter is quoting it mistakenly to say... um, it has happened, and he just got that one wrong. He's trying, he quotes it because in context, it matters. There's a, there's a beginning and end. Remember, I, like I said, the, the question here is, did it happen, and, it's, and is it done, or did it start to happen, and it's in process? And I would argue it's the latter. So going from the already to the not yet aspect, we would read in verse 20 about blood and fire, vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. Again, most of what's described there is the kind of thing that we would see in that Revelation 6 to 19 section, the not yet aspects of prophecy. We see in that verse there in Joel 2, quoted here in Acts, we see in Revelation 6 to 19, that the day of the Lord, there's this double-edged nature to it. That when he comes, his bodily return, it will bring vindication for the just. It will be a time of celebration, a time of jubilation. At the same time, in the same moment, it will be a time of utter dread and fear. Because Jesus is bringing judgment to the wicked. It's a double-edged nature. And I think that's what's described here in Joel 2 and now Acts 2. Now, 
step back from all that for just a moment. I just want to make sure you understand that when we talk about the already but not yet tension, it's not because I want to sound smart. And it's not because I want to come together and have, do a little intellectual exercise. It matters. It matters big time. If we don't get it right, we won't get the scripture right. And if we don't get that right, we're not going to get Christian life right. It matters. There's a simple little phrase that I think some have used. You've maybe heard something like this that I think drives this idea home about why it matters. Being a Christian means entering a process of becoming what you already are. Being a Christian means entering a process of becoming what you already are. Now, let me clarify some things about that statement. That statement does not mean you are more than enough and you should feel good about yourself. It does not mean what the Christian radio hosts often tell you. Okay? What it means is that in your wickedness, in your brokenness, in your lostness, in your blindness, that when you come to Jesus, you get him. And he is more than enough. In fact, what you get in Jesus is so good, I'm not here to tell you you're enough. I'm here to tell you, under the authority of God's word and by the power of Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you are perfect. Perfect. We may boldly approach the throne of grace to find mercy and help in our time of need because Christ, our forerunner, has gone in behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies that we can follow him there into the holy presence of God. None of us deserve it. He made it possible. You are not enough. He is more than enough. And he says, on the merit of my righteousness, you may come. Okay? So when you become a Christian, you become in an instant perfect. I had a Bible teacher in high school who used to say that. If you said, how are you? He would say, perfect. <laughs> Every time. He just wanted to remind you that that's true in Christ. But we all mess up, don't we? I'm not trying to give you a, to build you up with a false sense of, you're really great. <laughs> I, I can't smile big enough. There's a process. And, 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 the, and our heroes had to go through this process. Old and New Testament alike. R Romans 7 is famous where Paul clearly, he's, he's re talking out loud almost. Man, I blow it all the time. And he's apostle of Christ Jesus. So there's a process. But when you become a Christian, it's a process of becoming what you already are. You see at work, even in our everyday life, the already but not yet tension. In terms of my righteous standing before God, I am already clean. I am already perfect. Because like the song we often sing, God was satisfied to look on him and pardon me. But I also am a mess. And I can't clean myself up enough. I never will be able to. But when I become a believer, when the exchange happens, I turn myself over to be remade. Some of you are familiar with the Narnia series. There's a really powerful moment in one of the books. I can't remember which one. Where it's, it's, it's not um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So it's... Uh, it's Eustace is his name. And he's, this, he's a brat kid, right? And he's transferred into Narnia and he becomes a dragon. And he hates it. And he wants to shed the scales off. And there's this scene of him trying to pull the scales off and, and strip off this ugly beast of a thing that he's become. And he might successfully pull off a scale here or there, but they grow right back. And finally, Aslan shows up and says, you have to let me do it. And he blows it all away. And, and that's what happens. So we are changed in an instant. Already we are clean. And yet there is this process of, of growth, of, of being transformed, of being 
made new daily until finally we behold him as he is. Okay, finally, let's look at this last verse. We've talked about the players. We've talked about the prophecy of Joel 2, and we're still actually in that prophecy, but there's one verse I wanted to section off to focus in on it because it's really important, and I think it's instructive for us today, and that's the aspect of it that really is a promise of God himself. So he's quoting Joel 2 in verse 21. You know, he's just talked about this not yet portion of that prophecy, which, by the way, I don't know if you picked up on that, kind of bad news. Blood and vapor of smoke, sun being turned to darkness. Verse 20 is bad news. A a warning, you might say. This day of the Lord is going to be problematic for a lot of people. But that problem has a solution. A solution that is beautiful as it is true. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. From every nation. Every tribe and tongue. Anyone and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't care if you're Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's also a valuable insight that Peter quotes Joel 2, where the name of the Lord would be regarded as his holy name, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. So we understand that to be God the Father. But here, he's quoting Joel 2 and attributing that to whom? Jesus. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord now in his new covenant theology is Jesus. So it's implied kind of subtly, but it's strong when you see it. Jesus is God And he's going to state this explicitly later in this chapter and in chapter 4. That Jesus is the name by which men must be saved. Everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord, what shall be saved? And that is the good news. And so in that beautiful place of tension between the already and the not yet, is offered to those who observed it on that day as well as to us all these years later. A simple plea. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. That doesn't mean that Peter and later Paul and all faithful believers who are witnesses are telling people to come follow Jesus because he's cool. That's not what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. It doesn't mean like many people who are not believers want to say about Christianity that it's helpful teaching. And we can apply some of it to our lives because of its ancient wisdom. That's not what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. What it means to call upon the name of the Lord is answered for us in the phrase that follows it. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. In case you didn't figure it out, that's actually what we're calling on the Lord for. The picture is you're lost at sea and you're about to drown and you call out for rescue. And Jesus is that rescue. So it's not, I like Jesus. It's not, he's smart and so I'm going to apply it. It's, he is my rescuer. He is my only hope. I am lost, condemned, destined to die and suffer eternal condemnation. But he is my only hope. Jesus, save me. And therein is this, power of the Holy Spirit really 
displayed for us. It's not just just that he's powerful enough to create the heavens and the earth. It's not just that he can strike down any foreign enemy. It's not just that he can create or build or win battles. He can change the human heart. He can save the lost. He can defeat me in my stubbornness, in my pride. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord. For the unbeliever, Paul puts it this way. In Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Hopefully many of you go, yep, done that. Amen, brother. So most of us perhaps are living in the world of, yeah, we believe that. We said that. I'm saved. I got the blood of Christ on my account. I hear you. Amen. But I still mess up. I still fail. I still do the things I don't want to and don't do the things that I know I should. Well, there's good news for you too. You know, some of us don't realize this, but 1 John 1, 9 is a famous verse, but it's actually written to believers. So this verse isn't about getting saved. This verse is about getting restored. Restored to fellowship with God and with other believers. If we find ourselves in this situation, he says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just like Aslan blowing away the scales on Eustace. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're just a few verses in to the most powerful sermon ever preached. Not mine. Peter's. The witness has begun. And over time, the witnesses will change. The audience will change. But the message does not. It stays the same. Believe in Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That's good news. If you believe it, you are saved. And now that you are a believer, you are saved, you are a witness to the fact that he and he alone is mighty to save. He can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Just look at what he did with Peter. He can do it with you too. Let's pray. Father, sometimes I don't know exactly what to say. As I stand here, I recognize that I see so much of myself in Peter, it's pretty relatable. So full of passion. Not one to sit on the sidelines, but one that wants to see something done and make sure it happens. Yet so foolish. A leader, but a failed one, but never outside the power of your love and redemption. And whatever mistakes he had made, even to go so far as to swear that he never knew you, you deemed it the perfect vessel to proclaim the good news, to announce the arrival of the Holy Spirit in power. And what a testament that alone is, Lord, to what you've done. That you don't ask you don't require, I should say, for us to clean ourselves up so that we can become worthy of your mercy. You offer it freely. 
So Father, I pray that you would do that work in our minds and hearts, that daily you would remind us of this, that daily you would teach us to hand it over to you, to hear your call, to come follow me. Father, we thank you. I praise you. I ask that as we continue to work through this message and through this book, that you would do a a mighty work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.